After my recent forays into Minecraft minimum advancements and Hollow Knight low percent, I racked my magnificent brain for minutes on end to decide what my next challenge would be. And eventually, I landed on a game that I have played for a few minutes, Terraria, the 2D exploration game that even Minecraft recommends. So with the game sorted, I had to figure out what the goal of my run would be. Eventually, I decided on beating the final boss of the game, the Moon Lord, with the least amount of achievements possible. Now, on YouTube, there is exactly one video with this premise, but I decided not to watch it. I wanted to go in blind and figure everything out for myself, but it is linked in the description in case you want to check it out. Before we get into the run, I'll explain what achievements are in Terraria. These are little challenges that the game sets for you that, upon completion, give you a little fanfare and a badge in your menu. Now, this is designed to make a player feel good about themselves, but seeing as how I derive all my self-worth from likes and comments on my YouTube videos, I do not need these at all. So I set off, going through the 115 possible achievements, available as a version 1.4.4.9, to find the ones that would cause me the most pain, and boy did I find them. Here is a brief list of the things I cannot do in this run. Cut down a tree. Open a golden treasure chest. Have NPCs move in. Equip a grapple hook. Equip wings. Break a life crystal. Or upgrade my mana. Now obviously this isn't everything, but for those of you who have played this game before, this should be ringing a few alarm bells in your head. No NPCs means that I am unable to buy a lot of useful items, like bullets. No life crystals means no HP. And wings and a grapple hook? Those are staples of every build that makes it to hard mode. Additionally, there are a bunch of achievements linked to the occurrence of RNG events. For example, the Blood Moon. Fortunately for me, these events also require certain HP thresholds to be met, which is one slight benefit to avoiding the Heartbreaker achievement. So, I created my world, which I had previously scouted to make sure that this run would be theoretically possible, and made myself a new character, before beginning my run in earnest. Now, if you haven't played Terraria recently, you might have forgotten how much of a slog it is at the beginning. With the copper pickaxe and axe not being the most efficient at their jobs and requiring immediate upgrades. But fortunately, I get to skip all of that, as there are actually several achievements that immediately block me from upgrading to higher tier tools. Timber, benched, ooh shiny, and heavy metal all prevent me from upgrading my tools one way or another. Although I did find ways to eventually bypass all of these, and I will talk about them as they become relevant. Anyways, with my path kinda limited, I made the best of a bad situation, introduced myself to Bradley the Guide, and immediately made him a nice home to live in. No, not a fancy home with, you know, walls and a table and the like, but a nice cozy hole in the ground. See, he's even dancing with how much he likes it. You might also notice that my current movement is anything but standard. Well, that is because this run has two looming spectres watching over me. The Bulldozer achievement, for mining 10,000 blocks, and the Marathon Medalist achievement. This dastardly achievement requires that I walk a marathon, or roughly 69,000 blocks. Fortunately for me, the achievement only counts horizontal distance moved with your feet in contact with the ground, so all of this jumping actually serves a purpose in minimizing the chances that I get to the Moon Lord and cross this threshold before landing the final blow. From there, I head west to find and destroy two incredibly key items, these nondescript logs. It might seem like such a weird move, destroying such an innocuous thing, but it hides a sinister secret. This, my friends, is a fairy log, and if any of these exist on the overworld, there is a random chance that a fairy will appear while I am underground and attempt to lead me to treasure. Now, even if I wanted the treasure that it wants me to go to, which I probably don't, it gracing me with its presence is enough for the game to shower me with applause. Anyways, back to the log. We determined earlier that cutting down a tree is a big no-no, but as it turns out, the hint for the timber achievement is actually rather misleading. Turns out that getting wood in your inventory is actually what triggers this achievement. Cut down a tree, bam, achievement. Loot a chest that had wood in it, not so fast sunny, Terraria just told me that you just cut down a tree. So I carefully fill my inventory with dirt before breaking the little log to rid my world of this menace. Before I move on to the next fairy log, my gamer instincts, and a copious amount of pre-prep, tell me that there is in fact a sky island directly above me. So I build myself a pillar straight up to loot myself something precious. Or I tried to anyway, but I was swiftly murdered by the locals. And, because I had spent so much time messing about, night had fallen and I needed a way to survive. 
So with a carefully placed pitfall trap, I safely killed zombies all night, earning a few torches, which I can't make otherwise, but more importantly, earning the you can do it achievement. This achievement is earned by surviving a night. And Terraria's use of the word surviving is quite generous. What this actually means is that the night has to end and you have to be present. Doesn't matter if you're dead, when the night ends, congratulations, you survived. Even with all the glitches in the world, this one is likely impossible to skip. Moving on and back to my Sky Island loot. This horseshoe doesn't seem like it'd be particularly helpful, but it has the incredible ability to make me completely immune to fall damage, which is actually pretty punishing in Terraria. Not only does this make me much safer in my general exploring, it completely locks me out of accidentally earning the Lucky Break achievement for surviving a fall with just a sliver of HP left. In my testing, this seems to be about 15% HP. Now I can throw myself off of high places with reckless abandon. I continue my journey west, through the jungle, until I find my next target, the second and final fairy log in this world. But I am then struck by some bad luck. As I mentioned, Terraria has several events that randomly occur when certain conditions are met, and many of these events have achievements tied to them. This time, the King Slime spawns, which has a rare chance to spawn on grass when you are in the outer sixth of the world. Fortunately for me, King Slime only gives you an achievement upon defeat, so all it takes is for me to graciously accept death to dodge the Slippery Shinobi achievement. Again, it is now nighttime, but unlike before, I am not going to spend my night crying and waiting for sunrise. I am now a proactive adventurer, and as such, I travel to the nearby desert and begin digging a large hole trying to find loot. This is also where I first utilize a strategy to avoid the Ooh Shiny achievement, which asks you to mine your first ore. Unlike the timber achievement, when Terraria says to mine an ore, it means it. More specifically, it means to mine an ore with a pickaxe or explosive. What it does not count, however, is a mechanic introduced in version 1.4, block swapping, which allows me to hold a random block, in this case sandstone, and extract the ore while leaving the sandstone behind. No, I do not know why this works, and no, I will not question it. But it does mean that I now have access to making things out of metal bars. Well, if I had an anvil anyway. Continuing deeper into the desert, I make sure to kill all cacti I see. Like everything I do, this has a legitimate reason. Dying to a cactus triggers the watch your step achievement for dying to a vicious underground trap. Because of course, as everyone knows, cacti are nature's traps. After destroying nature's beautiful flora, I find what I am looking for down here, a bast statue. This statue has a variety of incredibly useful unintended interactions, but since I am doing this run glitchless, I am using it for its ability stated on the actual buff icon, which gives me an extra five defense while nearby. This amount may seem insignificant, but since armor is hard to come across, and I can't even wear a full set, 5 defense is pretty considerable. With my prize obtained, I head back to the fairy log, to finally fulfill my goal from like 20 minutes ago, and then I ascend, again definitely due to my finely honed gamer instincts tingling, to find yet another sky island, and this one gives me the ability to blow this early game right open. But within the chest waiting for me lies the legendary Star Fury, a weapon of unmatched power, it allows me to call stars from the very heavens to smite my foes. It also does substantially more damage than my copper short sword and has screen wide range. Now, while my weapons are ready to rush into hard mode, my soft fleshy self is not. So I adventure around to find a few more items to help me out. A blizzard in a bottle, or a nice double jump that gives me quite a bit of extra momentum. A crafting table, because while the game says that I can't craft one, it doesn't stop me from picking one up. An anklet of the wind, or 10% extra movement speed, and a feral claw, to allow me to swing my sword without having to click my mouse each and every time I want to do so. I then return home and search for another vitally important item, an anvil. This one I cannot take with me as Terraria has arbitrarily decided that the keyword for the heavy metal achievement is obtain, but I can still freely use the one provided to me by world generation. While I'm there, I use my resources to craft my first piece of armor, drastically increasing my natural defense from 0 to 4. I then set my sights a little lower. Or a lot lower. I descend towards hell, making sure to obtain any gems that happen to fall within my path. As I finally enter hell, I trigger the It's Getting Hot In Here achievement, 
Something that is going to be 100% mandatory for reasons I'll go into shortly. As I arrive, I receive a much warmer welcome from the locals than I think I deserve. I then obtain the guide voodoo doll, which is used to summon the wall of flesh, the boss that allows me to unlock hard mode. This triggers the like a boss achievement for holding a boss summoning item. Technically, I could avoid this achievement right now, but it is an achievement that I had to unlock sooner or later, so it really didn't matter. I then found one of the items in hell that is actually useful, a hell forge. This allows me to smelt my ore into actual metal bars. Now I can make armor without finding bars and chests scattered around the overworld. Using this, I made my second and final piece of armor for the moment, as wearing a full suit of armor triggers the matching attire achievement. And despite the name, the armor does not need to match. I also make a grappling hook. Now, before you get excited and think that I forgot one of the achievements I mentioned a couple minutes ago, I would like to draw your attention to a certain word, equip. Like my accessories, grapple hooks have a slot for me to equip them in. But the grapple does not actually need to be equipped to work. As long as it remains in my inventory, I can grapple as much as I want without triggering the hold on tight achievement. Now, the armor I made isn't actually going to last very long, but it does allow me to more easily farm for the armor I actually want. See, since I needed to get the like a boss achievement anyway, why not summon an optional boss and farm it? Well, because killing this boss, the Eater of Worlds, gives you an achievement. That's why. But what if I told you that, among all other bosses in Terraria, this worm is unique? Because unlike every other boss in the game, the Eater of Worlds actually consists of many smaller pieces. And each of these little pieces drops loot when killed. Do you see where I'm going here? I don't actually have to kill the boss to get its rewards. I can simply kill its segments and just before striking the final blow, lower my weapons and give up. This allows me to create the significantly better shadow armor. Not only does this give me a sizable increase in defense, it also increases my potential damage output by giving me a 10% better critical hit chance. Now, using an assortment of potions, I rush to my first required boss of the run, this random old man. Or more accurately, the giant skeleton head that rips out of his body. With my current gear and buffs, Skeletron falls rather easily. After removing his hands, he can only spin slowly towards me, which while menacing is not very effective. So I net my first kill and earned myself the boned achievement. But I am not done. Instead of taking a moment to myself, I throw myself down my elevator and immediately challenge the wall of flesh. Tossing the voodoo doll into the lava, rip Bradley, I begin my climactic battle with the gargantuan beast. But honestly, this fight is also quite easy. My buffs plus my range means that the wall of flesh goes down without posing too much of a threat. With its defeat, I trigger the still hungry achievement for killing the wall and the it's hard achievement for entering hard mode. Both of these are unavoidable as killing the wall of flesh is the only way to trigger hard mode and Moon Lord requires several hard mode exclusive bosses to be killed before it can be summoned. This fight is also the reason that the It's Getting Hot in Here achievement is mandatory, as summoning the wall while outside of hell will cause it to violently grab you with its tongue to forcefully drag you in, triggering the achievement anyway. I carefully loot the Wall of Flesh's items, but make sure to avoid this hammer, as it triggers the Hammer Time achievement for acquiring a hammer. This does have some ramifications going forward, as I cannot break a demon altar to spawn in hard mode ores, but the long and short of it is, breaking an altar triggers an achievement, and I don't currently have access to a pickaxe that is capable of mining those ores anyway. Now, I return home in hard mode, and need to figure out what I'm going to do next. My current gear is not going to cut it for upcoming boss fights, with the first few bosses being able to kill me in two or three hits. So I needed to find a way to get hard mode gear. Let's run through the list. Mine hard mode ore. Well, I've already said that that's not doable for a multitude of reasons. Kill hard mode bosses. Uh, see my microscopic health bar up there? Hmm. Oh, I got it. Fishing. Well, let's see how to get bait. Oh. Well, that's not good. I need a net, but that can only be obtained from a merchant, who I can't get. Or I can complete fishing quests, which one, give achievements, and two, requires me to be able to actually fish. Wait, down here in the patch notes, it says that I can obtain Master Bait from Jungle Mimics. So I just need to go here and... Cool, yeah, no. That requires a special seed and another achievement. So, according to this page on the wiki, I'm kinda out of options. But what if I wasn't? 
See, there is actually an item that can give me enough bait to kickstart my fishing journey. This item here has a 1 in 6 chance to spawn in any surface chest, and when consumed, gives me a great deal of worms, ready to be chucked straight into a pond to lure in fish. Though technically it's not fish that I want. So I craft sonar potions, which tell me what's on the end of my hook, and make myself a small fishing hole in the jungle. Like I mentioned, I'm not actually searching for fish. I am using these worms to lure in the elusive crates. Because as we all know, boxes cannot resist the urge to bite on my rod. These crates provide me with a plethora of incredibly vital resources, from more bait, thus fueling my fishing, to loot from chests, and, critically, hard mode ores. This source does not require me to actually go out of my way to mine this ore, nor even spawn it into my world. It is a completely achievement-free method to drastically increase my survivability. Now, despite the fact that this is a guaranteed way to eventually net me ore, it is not quick. Even maxing my fishing power, using a sonar potion to preserve bait, a crate potion to increase the chances of finding crates, and getting a significantly better rod from a bramble crate, I still spent two or three hours fishing. As even though you can get hard mode ores from these chests, it's not exactly super common. And when you realize that there are three tiers and two variants per tier, it becomes a lot more scarce. But after a lot of fishing, and briefly stopping by the mechanic I saved in the dungeon for a better fishing rod, I persevered and was eventually rewarded with enough cobalt and palladium to upgrade one piece of armor each, and enough mithril to craft myself a mithril anvil. Fortunately for me, this anvil is not tied to an achievement like the lead ones are. So now I have the ability to craft several endgame items that require this anvil, including the items that can summon the first three hard mode bosses, which would otherwise require a 1 in 2500 drop chance from any enemy for each of them. After completing this Herculean task, I move on to my next, somehow even worse, grinding section. I need a Rod of Discord. Well, actually need is a strong word, but the Rod of Discord puts forward a very convincing argument. It allows me to teleport. Not without limitations, but it is still a very strong movement option that will reduce the number of steps I am taking, as well as making it much easier to avoid damage from certain boss attacks. The only problem with it is its rarity. A Chaos Elemental is a relatively uncommon spawn, and only has a 1 in 400 chance to drop a rod. So I find myself a relatively open area in the underground hello, and create myself a little room suspended over lava to lure in my current target. Recently, the Chaos Elemental's spawning behavior was changed, so that they would not spawn if a player has not moved for the last 5 seconds. So I sat there, spamming my jump button for over 6 hours, before I realized that auto-swinging your weapon actually counts as movement as well. This made the grind much less laborious, but still incredibly slow and tedious. Eventually though, my inherent luck bore fruit, and I finally had a rod of discord to call my own. After over 12 hours of fishing and farming, you'd think I'd almost be ready to start fighting bosses, but unfortunately that is simply not the case. I have upgraded my armor somewhat, but my weapons are quite lacking. So using my obscene amounts of souls of light, I create a few keys of light to forcibly convert a harmless chest into a hallowed mimic, which I farm for a Daedalus Stormbow. And with this, I am finally ready. Perched in a small box suspended 50 blocks above the ground, I summon the Destroyer, the first mechanical boss. Because I'm so high up, the Destroyer can do almost nothing to me. And with enough time and a fair few holy arrows, I am able to rain down enough stars to destroy the destroyer. But as if embarrassing the worm wasn't enough, I summon it a second time and handily demolish it again to allow myself to get slightly more hallowed bars. But before I begin this harrowing gauntlet, I have to bring up an unavoidable element of RNG that meant that I had to routinely back up my information. I previously mentioned about a few RNG events that had health gates, like the Blood Moon requiring that I have 120 HP or more. There is in fact only one RNG event that is not determined by a player's max HP, and that is the Solar Eclipse. A 5% chance each morning that just so happens to be accompanied by the achievement Kill the Sun. Now, while I am a patient man, I really don't want to be repeating over 12 hours of grinding because I rolled a d20 and got a 1, especially since this roll happens every 24 minutes. 
I also did get a solar eclipse like the second day it was a possibility, so I am very glad I made that executive decision. Anyways, the next night I made myself a mechanical skull at the Mithril Anvil, saving myself grinding for another 1 in 2500 drop, and summoned Skeletron Prime. This fight wasn't too bad as my Stormbow was able to do copious amounts of damage while I maintained my distance, and I was able to teleport behind the boss whenever my small platform ran out of space. After just a few minutes, Skeletron Prime went down just as easily as his bony form, and I was rewarded with enough hallowed bars to make myself a new weapon, the Hallowed Repeater. I'm not sure which of these two weapons is technically best in terms of DPS, but my next few bosses were going to be fought in enclosed environments, or just simply moved too fast for me to want to try to effectively aim, so I thought a weapon with a more direct firing path would make it just a little bit more consistent. After stocking up on a whole lot more arrows, acquired by placing a crafting table next to a chest that generated with wood inside it, I told you I got around all those ones earlier, I tested my newfound weapon against the twins, the final mechanical boss. This boss spawns as two eyeballs connected by a string of sinew. Retinizer, the one with a red iris, shoots out lasers, while Spasmatism, with a green iris, shoots out fireballs. I decide to prioritize Retinizer, as the lasers are fired much more often and are quite a bit harder to dodge. With my newfound bow, I am able to swiftly reduce Retinizer to a pile of goo before turning my sights to Spasmatism. Spasmatism quickly falls below half HP and begins its second phase, which spells its own death as it simply does not get close enough to me to deal any significant damage. Eventually, the twins fall, and I am rewarded with the Bucket of Bolts achievement for killing all three mechanical bosses. The game then informs me that the jungle has grown restless, and really there is nothing left for me to grind for, so I head straight into the jungle to search for my next target, Plantera's Bulb. I make a small arena next to the bulb, utilizing teleporters purchased from the mechanic earlier. The strategy for Plantera is actually incredibly simple. Encase myself in a box with a small hole to shoot out of, and teleport whenever Plantera gets close. There was never any doubt in my mind that I would emerge victorious from this fight. So one achievement greater, I loot a pygmy staff and a temple key from Plantera. I honestly could not have picked a better drop to obtain here as the Pygmy Staff allowed me to summon a minion to passively increase my damage output, at the cost of literally nothing. Doesn't get any better than that. You know how I said I had nothing left to grind for? Well, I lied. I decided that the next few bosses really weren't anything to scoff at, with my paltry 100 HP, and the fact that I still wasn't wearing a top. I needed to get as many buffs as I possibly could to increase the likelihood that I actually survived the upcoming fights. So I went fishing for four fish, the Prismite and Armored Cavefish, found in the Hallow and Underground respectively, the Ebon Koi in the Corruption, and the Variegated Lardfish in the Jungle. These allowed me to make potions that netted me an extra 20% HP, 10% damage reduction, 10% increase in damage, and one extra summon to aid me. Not too shabby. I then head to the entrance of the Lizard Temple, deep in the underground jungle. I have the key, but I really don't want to open the door, because it'll just give me the Temple Raider achievement. Fortunately for me, if you recall, I have the power to teleport, so I just click my way in and skip the achievement altogether. I carefully navigate my way through the temple, disarming all the traps I come across by destroying the pressure plates before arriving in the boss room. I again disarm the traps in the room and begin to set myself up for what is likely going to be a very hard boss fight. See, for every other boss so far, I have been able to make the arena as large as I like, but the blocks of this temple are just too strong for me to break. So this arena isn't getting any bigger. With space at a premium, I am not going to get a lot of time to dodge attacks, and I really cannot tank that many to begin with. But I set up my arena as best I can, remembering that while I can piggyback off the wiring already in the temple, I'll also activate the connected traps. With my preparation complete and a wide array of buffs, I summon the golem and begin a harrowing fight. On my raised platform, I attempt to burst down the hands that are constantly being launched directly at my face, managing to deal with one before I knock the head off the golem. With the head now loose, I was able to damage the core, but I also had an invincible head above me ready to deal contact damage, shoot lasers, and spit fireballs, all while I was still contending with another fist. The fight was incredibly close, with me almost dying several times, but I eked out a victory, earning my ninth achievement, the Zardian Idol. Now, there are only two things left between me and the Moon Lord. The Lunatic Cultist, and the Celestial Invasion. But before I triggered that, I decided to go spelunking. 
I went searching for an item initially written off as unnecessary. Life crystals. I still can't break them, lest I want the heartbreaker achievement. But you know what I can do? I can place a little device called an actuator, acquired from the mechanic, underneath the heart. This device, when toggled, causes the blocks to change from an active to an inactive state, or vice versa. This destroys the crystal, as it cannot be supported by nothing. It does not count as me having destroyed it. Loopholes, baby! With a few of these crystals collected, I head over to the dungeon where the mysterious tablet has spawned, flanked by several cultists. This here is why the Skeletron fight and the boned achievement are unskippable, as the cultists do not appear if Skeletron has not been killed. So I build a small arena and kill the cultists, triggering the lunatic cultist to spawn. This fight is rather simple. The lunatic cultist cycles through three attacks, a volley of fireballs, an ice shard that shoots out smaller ice shards, and a lightning orb that fires off five arcs of lightning. They're all relatively easy to avoid. Every second cycle through his attacks, he will substitute the lightning attack for a summoning ritual, where he will create two clones to misdirect you. If you hit the clones, the ritual will complete and a dragon will spawn. This was universally a sign that I was going to die. But if you interrupted the ritual, the lunatic cultist would pause and you could get a few good shots in. Rinse and repeat until 50% HP, where he would occasionally substitute any attack for a barrage of light projectiles that really packed a punch. Fortunately, the Rod of Discord allows me to move through these with little to no risk. Repeat the process over and over, and eventually the lunatic cultist goes down. Unfortunately, as the old saying goes, there is no rest for the wicked. The lunatic cultist's death immediately triggers the celestial invasion, the last step before Moonlord. Four pillars have appeared across the map, each corresponding with a certain class archetype. Stardust for summoning, Nebula for magic, Vortex for ranger, and Solar for melee. This allows me to prioritize which pillars to tackle first. Before I get into the action, I'll quickly explain how the pillars work. Each pillar spawns with a shield that has 100 HP. This shield is immune to all forms of damage. So how do I kill it? Wait for it to die of old age? Well, no, there is a way to remove the shield. I just have to kill 100 enemies spawned by the pillar. Each enemy killed will release a red light that streaks back to the shield, removing 1 HP. Just kill enemies until the red lights stop appearing, and suddenly you have an unguarded pillar. I settle on Stardust Pillar first, as I can make a new summon weapon to passively increase my DPS. So I head towards the pillar, and to make a small box just outside of its spawn range. I then enter the Stardust Pillar's domain, and rush back to my box, hoping that this orb enemy follows me. This here is a Stardust Cell, an enemy that, upon death, splits into several smaller versions of itself. After a short pause, these smaller orbs will grow up and turn into new Stardust Cells, allowing me to safely farm 100 kills without leaving the comfort of my box. Once I have killed enough, I make a mad dash to the Stardust Pillar and summon a Rain Cloud just above it to get some passive damage in, and then get swiftly murdered. I didn't even really get a chance to hit the Pillar. Since this might take a few attempts, I decided I may as well stock up on some potions to maybe make the process a little easier. So I teleport to the left ocean, closest to the pillar, and begin running back. When all of a sudden we see, your mind goes numb, on the bottom left of the screen. So what does this mean, you ask? Well, it means that a pillar has died. As it turns out, that rain cloud I threw earlier, you know the one, it was just meant to give a little bit of extra damage. Well, it turns out that it doesn't despawn upon my death. And neither do the pillars, they are spawned indefinitely. This means that while I was mentally and physically preparing myself for what was honestly going to be a massive slog, the cloud was slowly chipping away at the pillar, until suddenly it collapsed. After looting the Stardust fragments left behind, I head back home and create myself a Stardust Dragon Staff. This is a massive upgrade compared to the Pygmy Staff acquired from Plantera. With this in hand, I begin to head to the Vortex Pillar, as I believe that ranged weapons are going to be my only chance at defeating the Moon Lord. And honestly, the Solar Pillar scares me. The strategy for defeating the Vortex Pillar is not quite as easy as the Stardust Pillar. Instead of making myself a little box outside of the pillar's area of influence, I need to dig myself a little hole in the ground within the area. But once this is accomplished, there is literally nothing that the enemies can do to stop me. I simply keep swinging my sword until the shield is depleted, 
teleport my way to the pillar and put down my rain cloud and die. This time, however, I know that the pillar is essentially dead. So I chill at my base and wait for the game to inform me of my well-deserved victory. I then scoop up my reward fragments, take them home and craft them into a phantasm. Another huge leap in the strength of my arsenal. From here, I head to the solar pillar. The nebula pillar, while slightly easier to deal with, only offers me magic weapons, which I really have no use for considering I cannot increase my mana. My strategy for the solar pillar is unfortunately fraught with danger. There is not a lot I can do to defend myself from the onslaught of the solar enemies, so I try to at least limit the amount of things I need to deal with at once. I jump into the solar pillars area, spawn a few enemies and quickly duck out. I can usually deal with 4 or 5 enemies at once, since they don't all attack at the same time. But anything more than that is certain death. It takes much, much longer than the other pillars, but fortunately the shield does not regain HP when I die. So eventually I succeed. All it takes from there is a single rain cloud and the solar pillar falls, leaving me with just one pillar, the least useful, but one of the more difficult of the four, the nebula pillar. Before I go and destroy this pillar, let's just have a look at the achievement list again. Oh, well that's unfortunate. So killing the nebula pillar would immediately summon the moon lord, allowing me to finish this challenge, but it also gives me an achievement, which is bad. There is a way to summon the moon lord using an item, but it also requires that I jump through a lot more hoops. But well, here it goes I guess. The Moon Lord can be summoned through the use of a Celestial Sigil. This item requires that I have 12 of each pillar's fragments. Well, looking in my inventory, it doesn't seem like that's going to be easy. But I can't give up. I've done so much jumping and so much grinding and so much fishing. I'm not giving up now. So I create a new world, same seed for convenience. And since you've seen how this all goes, I'm going to give you the cliff notes. Skeletron, demolished. Wall of Flesh, flayed. Mix, currently rusting. Plantera, salad. Golem, actually still pretty hard to be honest. Lunatic Cultist, rehabilitated. Now an upstanding member of society. And here we are, back at the Celestial Invasion once again. But if you think I can just kill the Nebula Pillar and go on my merry way, well, you've got another thing coming. Turns out that this achievement actually tracks kills across worlds, so I need to find another way to get nebula fragments. Well, it turns out that that can be achieved, since I can convert one of each of the three remaining fragments into one of the missing ones. So one Stardust, Vortex, and Solar fragment combines into one nebula fragment. So I go through, raining on the parade of the Solar, Stardust, and Vortex pillars, now I have enough fragments, which I take to my alchemy table in my original world. After some careful tinkering, I have a celestial sigil, and with my spare fragments I make as many super healing potions as I can. I may only have 100 HP, but I only want to drink the best. Well, here I am. Celestial sigil in hand. Ready to fight, to achieve my destiny. Huh. Now why isn't this working? One sec, I swear this doesn't usually happen to me. Damn. Turns out that this here sigil does not work while a celestial invasion is currently active. Which, if you're keeping track, is currently happening in both of my worlds. This is where a lesser man would give up, but not me. No sir. I exit the world and make a third and final world. You know the drill, wall of flesh calcified. The mechanical bosses, the hardest they've ever been, wait no scrap. Plantera plucked, and Golem, oh boy Golem, honestly actually still pretty hard. Finally, I arrive at the final hurdle, for real this time, Moon Lord. Killing Golem was the last requirement to spawn the Moon Lord with a sigil. I have my buffs, I have my arena, I have my weapons. I am ready. I wait for the night to end, and I finally make use of those hearts I collected earlier. I mean, the achievements are for reaching maximum HP, which these crystals cannot do, and breaking the crystals, which I have skipped. And there is no time for the HP gated RNG events to occur now. I am now the strongest I have ever been.
And with that, I summon my final adversary. The screen dims. The world shakes. My impending doom approaches. But I have never been more prepared for a boss in my life. The Moon Lord spawns in, a grotesque torso looming over me. I begin to put my strategy into action. I run right, shooting my phantasm directly into the eyeball staring at me from the Moon Lord's hand. All of a sudden, I teleport, back to the start of the arena. Moon Lord teleports to keep up with me, but I keep running. Stopping means death, and turning around is one of the most dangerous things you can do in this fight. The Moon Lord fires his phantasmal death ray, a move I do not want to be hit by. I mean, it has death in the name. But this is where my rod of discord comes in. I narrowly teleport through the death ray and continue my mad dash right. Eventually, the eye in the Moon Lord's right hand gets out, so I begin to focus on the left. My constant movement has meant that the Moon Lord never really has any time to catch up, and I am able to avoid many of his attacks. A few moments later, and the left eye is out too. My dragon has steadily been chewing on the eye in the Moon Lord's forehead throughout the fight, and it too is swiftly sent packing. From there, it is just the Moon Lord's core. But with the combined effort of me and my dragon, the Moon Lord is cut down, and I am done. I unlock my final achievement, Champion of Terraria, which honestly feels pretty apt. 11 achievements unlocked. Now this run was a lot of fun, but it was very hard. Turns out that wings and HP and armor set bonuses make Terraria much, much easier. Who knew? Do you think that any of these achievements could be skipped glitchless? I sincerely challenge anyone to try bring this lower. I cannot think of a single way that doesn't involve glitches. Also, let me know if you would be interested in seeing another version of this run completed with glitches. There are some insane things you can do in Terraria, and I definitely think this number can be brought down substantially with their inclusion. If you have any suggestions for a game you think could be interesting to try this sort of challenge in, feel free to let me know in the comments. Until next time.